Hi. All right. Good afternoon. This is our first set of notes from Chapter 10 on the Theory of VLE. So we've previously talked about Theory of VLE before back in Chapter 7. The difference was back in Chapter 7, we were talking about or discussing vapor-liquid coexistence and pure component systems. In the second half of the book, beginning with Chapter 8, our focus has now turned towards mixtures. So in Chapter 10 here, when we refer to the Theory of VLE, we're referring to uh, vapor-liquid coexistence involving multi-component systems. So in this first set of notes, we'll work through our conceptual derivation of our criteria of phase coexistence, uh, namely our criteria of uh, chemical equilibria. The only difference compared to what we saw in Chapter 7 is that in Chapter 7, we used molar Gibbs free energy. In this chapter, we'll now use chemical potential. Right, the idea in the pure component limit, chemical potential is just equivalent to molar Gibbs free energy. Uh, they're one and the same. Okay, So we're just replacing molar Gibbs free energy with partial molar Gibbs free energy or equivalently chemical potential. Okay, Otherwise, this should look very similar to Chapter 7. We'll go through the full discussion nonetheless because hopefully it'll serve, at the very least, as a good review. Okay. And so we're going to start out with a picture, right? a picture of a heterogeneous closed system. Right, so what do I mean by this? Okay. My system is heterogeneous in that if I were to take a sample at random from within my system, where here I'm defining my system with the solid black line. Okay. So if I were to take a sample at random from uh, within my system, the properties are not going to be the same throughout. So if I were to take a sample from phase 2 and a sample from phase 1, the properties of that sample from phase one are not going to be equal to the properties of that sample from phase two. It's heterogeneous. It's closed in that mass can't cross my system boundary. Okay? Mass can't cross the solid black line. Okay? So it's closed. Okay? It's closed so that mass can't cross my system boundary, but my system can exchange heat and work with my surroundings. Okay? Our heterogeneous closed system is unique and they could also be viewed as um, a composite system consisting of two homogeneous open systems. What do I mean by that? If I were just to look at phase one, so if I define my system boundary as such, okay, it is such that it's homogeneous, the properties are uniform throughout phase one, okay, but it's open in that mass can now cross my system boundary. I could go through and you know say the same thing about phase two, okay. but what makes our composite system unique or interesting is that if mass or moles were to leave phase one or phase two, right? We said they're both homogeneous open. Okay, what makes this composite system interesting is that any mass that were to leave phase one would have to go to phase two. Likewise, any mass that left phase two would have to go to phase one. So I can view phase one and phase two as being two homogeneous open systems, okay? but it's unique in that it's a composite system in that we have this constraint that any mass that leaves phase one has to go to phase two, any mass that leaves phase two has to uh, go to phase one. Okay? So we have a heterogeneous closed system, which we could view as a, a composite system consisting of two homogeneous open systems. Okay? So our criteria of phase coexistence now. Okay? Well. Again, we said we can view our you know, system as a heterogeneous closed system. And so in a closed system, mass or moles are constant. And so what that means then is that um, you know, n is, is constant, dn is equal to zero. And so at equilibrium, we find, um, so let me take a step back, right? When we talk about equilibrium, right now what we're trying to work out is our criteria of chemical equilibrium, okay? We said when I have phases of coexistence, I'm going to have thermal, mechanical, and chemical equilibrium. What I mean by thermal equilibrium is that I have equality of temperatures in my two phases of coexistence. So there's no uh, desire or net exchange of heat between those two phases. Second criteria is mechanical equilibrium. So there's no desire for the two phases to exchange um, work. Right? We have an equality of pressures. The third that we're trying to work out is our criteria of chemical equilibrium. So if I have a closed system, n is constant, differential of n is equal to zero. And since I have two phases at thermal and mechanical equilibrium, 
then temperature and pressure are both constant, so dt and dp are both equal to zero, okay? which leads us to dg, the differential of my molar Gibbs free energy is zero, or equivalently, the differential of my extensive Gibbs free energy is equal to zero. Right? I can write in terms of my extensive because n is also constant. So then the thought exercise in terms of deriving our criteria phase coexistence is, well, let's imagine taking some differential number of moles from phase one. Okay? And so if some differential number of moles of, you know, are going to leave phase one, the only place that it can go is to phase two. Okay? So if I use you know, subscript i just to indicate an arbitrary uh, component um, in my system, then if you know, I were to take some you know, smidget of or, you know, differential number of moles from phase one, okay, the change in extensive Gibbs free energy to phase one is going to be negative mu i in phase one, uh, del ni, where del ni is the differential number of moles of species i that I'm taking from phase one. And again, he said this is one of the differences you'll notice as compared to chapter 7. Chapter 7, we used molar Gibbs free energy. Here we use chemical potential, chemical potential being equivalent to my partial molar Gibbs free energy. Um, so here, you know, the you know, differential um, or the extensive change upon removing some differential number of moles of species I from phase 1 is negative mu I uh, del Ni. So that differential number of moles that's leaving phase one has to go to phase two, okay? So the gain or the extensive of change uh, in my uh, Gibbs free energy in phase two is gonna be a positive mu I two uh, del Ni, right? I use mu I two because uh, phase two is homogeneous, just like I used mu I one here because phase one is homogeneous, okay? So in order for my molar Gibbs free energy and extensive molar Gibbs free energy in my system to remain constant, it must be that mu i1 is equal to mu i2. So um, what we arrive at is for the case of multi-component systems, my criteria of chemical equilibria is that the chemical potential of each species in each phase must be equal to each other. Right? So mu i in phase one has to be equal to mu i in phase two. Okay? And so just to make this clear, if I had a binary mixture, say composed of components one and two, Okay. and say phase one corresponded to a liquid and phase two corresponded to vapor. Chemical potential of component one in the vapor phase is equal to chemical potential of component one in the vapor. Chemical potential of component two in the vapor phase is equal to chemical potential of component two in the liquid phase. Okay. So it's chemical potential of each species in each phase is equal. Okay. But we say nothing about the relationship between the chemical potential of, um, say, species one and species two. And that wraps up our first set of notes for uh, chapter 10.